it's enough. Y'all, it's the queen of automation, Megan Donnelly, here to give you inspiration. Founders and business owners, gather round. I'ma show you how to build systems that are astound. Streamline your processes, no need for complications. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Queen of Automation podcast, where we talk about why technology is only good when it works and how I help you make it work. I'm your host, Megan Donnelly, and today is exciting because I finally get to chat with John Prendergast, one of my favorite non-corporate, like always bringing the fun wealth management guys. We tried this conversation a few months back when I started this whole podcast journey and we logged on and I wasn't using Riverside and it was like, everything was broken. And of course, John is the most patient person in the world because he are, he's had a podcast for a while now. He was like, it's okay, we'll reschedule. Well, now it's like three months later. And I'm like, hey, do you wanna still talk to me? I'm surprised he didn't just hang up or like delete all my messages. But anyway. No, I love it. John I love is, what you're doing, man. <laughs> John is so fun. And we had such a good conversation that day, even though we, none of it was recorded. And I think, honestly, now that I remember, it was um, user error. Like, I just forgot to hit the record button. So I, you know, it was like something really, really stupid. But anyway, say hi, John. Introduce yourself. And give everybody a little bit of a, a background on who you are. Sure. Uh, hi, John. Uh, sorry, couldn't resist the dad joke there. Uh, <laughs> hi, John. So uh, I'm John Prendergast. I am CEO and founder of Blue Leaf Wealth. We are an all-in-one wealth management platform for financial advisors and their clients. And we deliver really spectacular client experience. It's one of our big differentiators. And one of the reasons that I'm so interested in what you do, Megan, is because a lot of what we do is about automating process in the background for financial advisors. So uh, there's a real intersection between what you do and what we do. And we are going to absolutely talk about that for sure during this call. But one of the things I always start the kind of conversations with talking about work-life balance, because I am a huge believer that there's no such thing as work-life balance. And you know this. And, and again, everybody, John is also in the brand built community. <laughs> and so he, you know, we talk about this a lot, like it's one life, you know, like we have one life, you know, you're either working yeah. on personal stuff or you're working on business stuff, but it's all the same. Like there's not really a separation. You can't separate work from my, like, you just can't do it. So it's right. kind of a funny, ridiculous saying. So I'd love to get your take on that. I love asking everybody this question because the diverse answers we get and some of the stuff, it makes you go, huh? Cause everybody thinks about it in a different way. Things that make you go, hmm. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. For, so do you have that sound it, bite? Like on your, can you like. I, I wish I did. <laughs> um, I wish I did. And I'm not that much of a singer, so I can't really deliver that <laughs> one. But it's all life. So, so for me, it has always been about work-life integration as opposed to balance. Balance always struck me as a concept that made sense if you, if you weren't lucky enough to do what you love. Um, and, um, and, and yes, we, we all need to spend time away from work, uh, but I never felt comfortable with this idea of keeping it at bay and putting it at the other end of the scale to balance the scales. Um, I think it is really about um, living free. I think it's about being able to choose what you want to do when you want to do it uh, and if you choose to do things that are related to your work all the time and you get joy from that, I just don't see the issue. Exactly. Exactly. And I've got a family, to, to be clear. I've got uh, three amazing kids that are grown and out of the house now. And this isn't about an excuse to spend lots of time away from my kids. I spent tons of time <laughs> with my kids because that was also what I wanted to do. But I didn't want to be constrained necessarily to a traditional, you know, nine to five, nine to six, nine to nine, whatever it would be. And so being an entrepreneur has certainly given me flexibility to move what might be a work day, uh, you know, effort onto a Saturday or to a Sunday so that I could attend a soccer game or do some coaching or what have you. Um, so that doesn't feel like balance to me. That feels like integration. 
Exactly. I, I love, I love the word integration and you and, um, our brand built friend, Josh McLean use integration a lot. And your two are similar in that way of thinking. And I absolutely love that term because when it, when I first heard it, I was like, Oh, that makes way more sense because it's not about not working on business when you're working on life. It's about picking and choosing when you want to work, where you want to work, how you want to work, who you want to work with. The best part about, I think about being a business owner and entrepreneur is picking and choosing the people that you network with, the people that you integrate with, the people that you talk with on a regular basis, which is so completely different, right? Um, and it's funny that you say integration because Josh is, I say that Josh, that was really weird. Josh is, um, he works in a corporate environment, but he's yeah. figured out this integration, work-life balance integration, and he still makes corporate work. So you can do it. Like it's not, we're not sitting here on our soapbox and high horse and saying, you all have to quit your job and be entrepreneurs like us. And that's not it. It's have, it's doing, you said it earlier, it's doing what works for you, whether it's entrepreneurship or working for somebody else. I mean, there are people that want to go work eight to five or whatever, and then go home and then, you know, do it again the next day. That's just what they want to do. So I love the term integration. It's like my new favorite thing now because it makes so much sense, right? We're all here, in my opinion, whether you work a your own business or you own your own company or your own business or you work for someone else, or be, the whole point is to build a lifestyle and not a career, right? Set real life goals. Like I want to put a deck on my house. I want to buy a new car. I want to go on a cruise. I want to live your life make money to live your life, not the other way around. I think it's all about building a life and it's about building the life that you want, not the thing that somebody tells you you should want, but exactly. what you actually want. And we all have more power than we often recognize. And, um, you know, I, put up a post on LinkedIn, one of our favorite places, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, and it was talking about that, you know, our, our job as, as leaders in, in companies, CEO, isn't to empower employees. That's not our job. But the reason it's not our job is because people walk in the door with power. And it is all about, for me, as a leader, trying to help them find it and use it. Yeah, because people really struggle with, I think when you work for somebody else, you really struggle with, or at least I did when I was working for somebody else, I uh, struggled with understanding my own boundaries. If you go to work for somebody else and you know your boundaries and you hold to them and you're very strong, like, okay, I'm not gonna work 70 hours a week for someone. I'm not going to work 65 hours a week. Now, obviously, you know, if the employer that you're choosing to work for doesn't like that, well, then that's probably not the job for you, right? Like, I mean, right. you, have to, you have to know your personal boundaries. If you're somebody who wants to hustle all the time and work 24 hours a day, and you don't mind doing it for somebody else, kudos to you. To me, that sounds yeah. subtle. <laughs> like, and, no, thank you. And that's still that. a choice. That's still a choice, yeah, right? Exactly. You're choosing to work there. And exactly. yes, l let's face it. There are some people with less choice than others and have less agency, less ability to make a change. Yeah. No, no question. Um, but most of us have more power and choice than we recognize or admit. Exactly. And I've chosen the other path. So yeah, I'm an entrepreneur now and I've, I've been back and forth, um, in the entrepreneurial world and started several companies and been part of founding teams, et cetera. But I've also worked a very intense corporate job. I was an investment banker doing mergers and acquisitions and taking companies public for um, about seven years and leading deal teams and, and the like. And those hundred hour weeks are real. Um, yeah. And, yeah. but that was what I wanted to do at the time. Right. Once I had enough fun and um, and it was time to do something else, I made a change. Can I just comment for a second that you didn't put fun in? You said fun or funds? Fun. 
Yeah, I bet you didn't put that in air quotes after the hundred hour a week sentence. So yeah, I was I was yeah. so expecting you to say once I had enough fun, you know, <laughs> burning myself out, burning the midnight oil. No, I'm just kidding. I'm well, kidding. there you look. That was miserable. The the hours themselves, yeah. and yeah. you know, uh, can I swear on this podcast? Absolutely. So Go for it. one saying we had <laughs> was, and this was all too common. If you were there at 4 a.m. doing work, somebody fucked up. Unfortunately, somebody's fucked up all the time. So you were often there at 4 a.m. doing something. And, <clears throat> and that wasn't fun. But the intensity of the work in another way was amazing. It was really cool. Um, yeah. And to, be, to have a, a huge deal, um, a half a billion dollar acquisition in my hands and and to get that across the finish line that was a cool feeling it was a cool accomplishment and i i learned a ton doing it but once that part stopped being interesting and fun and it yeah. did eventually uh the rest of it just wasn't worth it and i can assure you while the money was amazing i was not doing it for the money and i wouldn't have done done it for the money and i wouldn't have traded that much of my life for money it was all about the experience for me yeah so whenever I hear you, so what I love about listening to you talk is because you you make this, and we'll get into what you're doing now because it's I mean it's different but similar whatever same quote unquote niche if you I hate that word anyway we have to, we have to come up with a new word I feel it has like to do with money we have to brainstorm it's a related a field well no we have to we have to brainstorm a new word for niche because I hate that word I don't know why anyway what I love listening to you. When, when you're talking, I love it because you make it, you make it fun. You make it not corporate, not stiff, not like when you think of, you know what I think of when I talk to you, the show suits, <laughs> that's what I think about when I, you know, even though they're lawyers, they're like not lawyery and we're going to use yeah, that word. It's not a I get word, it. but we're it anyway. Like, it's just funny that I you say about. that. Right? I think because... about show suits when I think about you talking about like investment banking and money and wealth management and all this stuff. Sure. And I'm like, he is like the Harry of wealth management, right? <laughs> have you seen suits? Have you actually watched it? You have to watch it now. Uh, so I've, I've seen a couple of episodes, mostly because my daughter, when she was here over the summer, was binging one of the seasons. So ah. I kept wandering through while, yeah. while it was on. Well, what's funny about show. that is, you know, it if you look at what I've got on, uh, and for those of you who are listening uh, and not watching, um, I, I've just got <laughs> essentially a flannel shirt on. Um, not a not a Tim Walds kind of flannel shirt. It's, it's kind of cool, I think. Uh, but it, it's, uh, yeah, definitely not. A suit. Outdoors man flannel shirt. And he's got like a neon sign behind him with like a purplish looking wall. I mean, like this is not. This is not Mr. I'm wearing a suit to nope. work every day, going to Wall Street investment nope. banker guy. Like, nope. and he swears. And he, anyway. I do. Yeah. That's like what you have to, so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to watch Suits because it's even just a few episodes, so you get the frame of reference, and you're gonna be like, oh, now I get what Megan's talking about. Fair enough. I'll do so it. So you, it's so you. Anyway, moving on from that. So. John is also in, I know we talked about it a little bit in the, in the brand belt community. And, um, we talk a lot about operations and there's quite a few kind of wealth management investment guys in the community and gals too now, but, um, I love talking ops with you because you, like you said earlier, you are on kind of the other side of the wealth management space where you're actually putting systems and processes in place which is so exciting to me, one, because I'm a nerd, but two, because the financial industry is so broken when it comes to technology. Like you would think that like they're dealing with our money. Like they've, they've, they've got to be left lock solid and like, sure. Like 1982 green screen of death. Like their software is like, so it's better. Yeah. It's better now the last, you know, five, years, maybe 10 years, but it's, I just remember it, it was just taking the financial industry to get like, to get up to speed with digital experience and just digital software and automations and systems in general so long. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Um, but there and there are different parts of the industry that are 
behind for different reasons. Yeah. Um, if we talk about the customers that that I serve, which are independent wealth managers, so these are um, small to mid-sized businesses, generally speaking. So you can think revenue range of you know half a million to you know a hundred million a year, right? That range. Not we're not talking about billion-dollar corporations that we're selling to, generally speaking. Um, those those folks tend to be behind the curve in terms of technology and automation, primarily because that isn't what they care about. They really care yeah. about serving clients and technology and frankly, running the business is more of a nuisance than an interest. And, and so their focus is just elsewhere and, um, and they're relatively small businesses often, right? So uh, I'd say the average wealth management firm is, you know, two or three people and, they're mostly very client focused as they should be. And so there's just not a lot of expertise in there to build systems that really work. And it's usually just a mess. Like, so I've, I've had a few um, wealth management clients that have needed operations help. And they, I mean, I'm like, it's what's funny is when it comes to knowing their clients numbers, like they are spot on, but knowing their own data and information, they're like, well, why do we need to track that? I'm like, oh, come on. I'm like, do you have a CRM? Where are you putting these people? Oh, well, I've got an Excel spreadsheet. One guy was like, I could keep track of them on my iPhone. I'm like, mm -hmm. Wait, you do what now? Yeah. So you have all of, the, all of your customers, like personal and data and information on your iPhone. Well, between that and my Google sheet, I'm like, yep. And you're dealing with money. I'm like, yeah. that's cool. Like, now, that isn't necessarily. You don't get audited. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they're keeping a lot of financial information there, generally speaking. But yeah. that that is right. That is, you know, it's the the problem with being so focused on serving clients, and that's literally all they care about. Yeah. That, in some sense, they don't get kind of the enlightened self interest to mm -hmm. realize that they could do more and better of, of those things that they want to do, investing a little time and energy into building out automation. And yeah, it doesn't even it, have to be fancy. It's a real battle to, to help, help them see that. Um, usually though, at some point in those businesses, they just run into some wall or another and, and they're forced to confront automation. And I've always yeah. said that there's kind of a magic inflection point when you get to about five employees. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of one of those inflections where it's just too much at that point. Yeah. And you, you need some level of systems at that point. And you generally see people jump up a notch um, yeah. in, in their sophistication at that point. Also, if you think about it, <clears throat> technology moves really fast. And if you think about the number of amazing systems that have come out the last three or four years. And I'm not even talking about AI, but just automation um, software yeah, that, that can help you construct your own type of automation um, that wasn't even available when they started their business. Uh, so it's all new and it's just not something they're paying attention to. So I guess it's incumbent on us to help them learn, right, Megan? Absolutely. I love, I love talking to these guys because they, well, and they're, you know, what's great about numbers guys, when you show them numbers, they're like instant, like, where do I sign? Like numbers guys, you show them the numbers, you show them the amount of time they're going to save so that they can focus on their clients more, you know, and it's really, it's really like that with anybody, you know, but they want to focus on their clients. That's all they want to do. So show them how to do that right like right. And it's, it's like this is what you're good at you do that we'll be over here doing this and it's so it's come so long in the last 10 years but i just it's just still it's just so funny to me that that the money the, the money people are still like at least two or three years behind other than like companies like stripe and stuff like that that are in the forefront because they have to be but sure um Anyway, craziness. So let's talk about your what like your actual company and what you're doing what working on these days because I think it's very fascinating. Again, geek, but that's okay. Um, I think it's very fascinating how you're helping these 
companies transition into um, the next phase of their business, really. Yeah. So the, the best way to describe what we do is it, we can talk about several of the functions that we automate. And most of what we do is actually back office. So not what you think of as exciting. Uh, so these are, are functions like reporting, uh, both on the business and about the client um, for client presentation. Uh, we do things like billing and invoicing. So calculating how much to bill each client and then uh, actually, um, you know, issuing the bill and or um, getting that debited from their accounts. Uh, we also do trading and rebalancing. So, you know, people figure out, okay, what is your, what should your money look like? And as things change and the market moves, it gets rebalanced back to its target. Um, those are the, the kind of bread and butter things that we do. All of those pieces have pretty traditional automation, right? So think about reporting. I can tee up a thousand clients to get different reports at different intervals automatically and just fire them up. Uh, it'll, it has a workflow built in that will send it through to someone for approval. They can flip through the finished product, see if everything's good. If not, they can opt out of some of them and, you know, check them back in to, to make a change. Uh, and bang, you've, you know, can send in minutes, a thousand reports. Um, however, the other thing that we do is a bunch of automated uh, support for their clients. So we we deliver a client facing inter interface where clients can self serve um, on mobile, on web. We deliver outbound messaging that goes to clients. Uh, it's another way to get information to uh, to their clients and bring the brand and the experience to life for their clients. So it's a bunch of touch points that otherwise would be traditionally manual or on phone or what have you, but we've, we've automated it so that we get them, um, you know, many cases, 50 or 60 touch points a year with their clients via their brand and their technology. And that's really the, the place that we hear from our advisors where we save them the most time, because by having those proactive, um, communications going out to clients, w what we hear is when the markets were bad, like they were, you know, what, uh, two weeks ago now, big, big dip on a Monday, our customers generally don't get panic phone calls. And that's because the advisors already been in touch with them, um, either that day or the day before, uh, already given them an update, already done all of the things that you might imagine doing. And so the client's know where they're at. They know what's going on. They know what the plan is and they feel comfortable and confident where in our industry, a traditional advisory model might have four or five sort of meaty contacts with a client over the course of a year and otherwise might send them a newsletter or something that they don't even open. And, and just, there's just a limited amount of contact. So all of that connection and automated touch points that we deliver, creating what we call an engagement loop, making wealth management <clears throat> engagement feel a lot more like the engagement you get on Netflix or Facebook in the way that that interacts with you. Uh, that I, I really changes the game. I think of your software as, and I mean, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, it's almost like a CRM for wealth management or like an all-in-one CRM type of system because it's like, the businesses have all of their clients and all of their like, and, and that's really what it is. And, but it's specific to that industry, right? Because you yeah. cannot put, and again, I'm not a sales first person, but we'll just use them as an example, right? Like you can't put a traditional HubSpot or Salesforce in place for a wealth management business because there's so much of their business, obviously that we're just relying on the, the um the data in the reporting the financial data and the financial reporting part of it that if you were to put a traditional crm in, you're gonna have to go out and buy something like you have anyway because it's not going yeah. to it's not going to give them what they need so when we yeah. first started i was like this is really cool because they don't necessarily need a traditional crm that's not well, going to necessarily help them get to where they want to be so let me tell you how that actually plays out. And it's interesting that you say that because at one point we were playing with that way of describing Blue Leaf or much earlier in our evolution. This was 2013, 2014. <clears throat> and what we realized was 
that we were the best possible companion to a CRM rather than a replacement for a CRM. And part of the reason for that is what we did in some sense drove what the CRM recorded, right? If you think about it, CRM can uh, both record what's happened and also prompt you to do things. Um, but we're sort of in a different place in, in the sense that we're, we're actually doing things in terms of delivering communication to, to the clients automatically with relevant personalized information on behalf of uh, the advisor. We're also highlighting opportunities for the advisor that wouldn't necessarily be in a CRM. And we are also an integration partner with a lot of these uh, CRM systems. So uh, certainly Salesforce, uh, but some of the, the CRM systems are really targeted and focused on just our market. So I'm thinking about companies like Wealthbox and Redtail, they are CRM for wealth managers. Because you're right in saying that a traditional CRM just isn't customized for the workflows or the view of the world that wealth managers must have. Um, so exactly. significant things. And in fact, with Salesforce, most wealth management firms that are large enough to use Salesforce actually use a specialized version of Salesforce called, what is it, Financial Cloud or something like that? That's kind of what I was thinking too, because Salesforce and even HubSpot, like you, you could absolutely put it in place, but it's going to take such a heavy hand, like a development hand to make it work the way that you need it to work. And you're going to have to custom. It's not, well, I mean, they're, okay, first of all, there's no out of the box system that's going to work for every single business across the of board. Course. Anyway. So you're going to have, you know, you're going to have custom automation and custom workflows and all of that stuff, but especially for the financial world. And then so it is such a, um, it's something that you really don't want to screw up, right? Like when you're talking about somebody's money, like it's a big right. deal. Like you, you oh, know, yeah. you mess up, you know, you mess up data numbers when you're referring to financial data, and it's kind of a big deal. People get pissed off, like they as do. well they could, you know. Man, they do. Uh, and in <laughs> fact, just two weeks ago, when that market correction happened, Schwab itself was mistakenly showing zero dollar balances in accounts. Like, so it. It wow. happens and it can happen. That right, I didn't know. That's crazy. Yeah, it can happen right at the source. Um, no, it was quickly corrected and it didn't mean that there was actually zero money in their accounts or that they had lost track or something like that. Just a glitch in a very big, very complex system. Um, so the other thing you've got to do if you're in our, our industry um, is, yeah, you've got to have all kinds of safeguards and processes in place to prevent that. But if somebody you know sneaks one by and and that happens you also have to have process that allows you to recover very quickly um and that it, it, both things are important the pivot factor when it comes to stuff like that is having systems and processes in place so that you're not being re reactionary, you're, you know, mm -hmm. you're being proactive. Like you have stuff set up so that if something happens, you can proactively reach out. You can proactively, like, like you're already ready for it. Like you were ready right. for it. So, yeah. you know, and that's we, the thing. That we have to be. Yeah. yeah, we have that's to be, and our, our customers have to be as well, right? They, things go sideways. And in, in their case, it's probably more when the market goes sideways that, creates all kinds of issues in their business, which is why a system like ours that has already been proactively sending messages out to clients and connecting with them in that way, very much tamps down the anxiety clients feel in that right. moment. Uh, it right. all becomes just part of the journey that they're used to, as opposed to getting their narrative set by the media. Essentially, the wealth management firm through automation is, is delivering their own narrative, which is custom to yeah. the client. And that that is a really powerful way to defend against the way that the media whips people up. Absolutely. 100% agree. Um, we are coming up on time, so I don't want to take up too much of your day, but I'm no so glad that you were here. Tell everybody how they can find you. If they are interested in learning more about you. How they sure. Can find I mean, you. you know, the easiest thing, if you're interested in connecting with me, I'm all over LinkedIn. Remember brand built. And so so I'm, I'm on LinkedIn most days and uh, pretty easy to get a hold of there. Personally, it's just uh, John Prendergast and you'll know because I'm the Blue Leaf Wealth guy. 
And if you want to know anything about Blue Leaf, it's just www.blueleaf.com. It's very cool. I suggest you go check it out because if you're a geek like me and you want to wear it, and it, you know, I know it's not direct to consumer or anything like that, but I kind of wish it was because it looks like a really cool platform. But I mean, what would I do with it? Nothing. Anyway, it's a very, it's a very interesting business model and I really think it's fun, but that's me. <laughs> anyway, guys, that is a wrap. Thank you so much, John, for being here. And we will see you next week. And remember, technology is only good when it works. Only Bye. good when it works. Thanks, Megan. <laughs>